So we've got, um, we're going to be starting uh, with uh, Todd Toller from Wiley, uh, who's going to represent the sort of perspective of large publishers, uh, a lot of the publishers who are, uh, as, as have been pointed out by Ginny and, and Ed, uh, who are our founders. Um, and then we're going to have Katrina McCullum from Hidenawi talking uh, from the medium publisher perspective. And then um, uh, from the small publisher perspective, Annie, Anna Danivola. Um, and, um, and then we're going to switch it around and talk to some people who are, are, are not necessarily members, but who use our services and, and uh, either find them valuable or not. I guess we find that out. Um, and we're going to find, uh, listen from a research funder, Christian uh, Gutnick um, from the Swiss National Science Foundation. And, um, and then uh, from an academic group, Luda Waltman uh, from the University of Leiden. So in, in that order. Um, what I'm going to do, just so that everybody's aware of what's going on here, and is I'm going to be there with a timer, um, letting them know how much time they've got, and they can see me there. Um, and um, if they go over, that thing in the corner is a laser cannon. Um, <laughs> and we take this thing kind of seriously. All right. So, uh, so Todd, uh, I guess you're first, and take it away. And oh, also, the laser cannon has a hair trigger, so if you do say something upsetting, you know. Great. All right. I guess I better. I'm going to go fast. It'll be like a Ramon show, like a really boring Ramon show. Um, so my name's Todd Toller from Wiley, direct, uh, Vice President of Product Strategy and Partnerships. Uh, my background, user experience, product management. I've really been thinking about sort of post-print journal workflows. I'll admit right now I'm very journal-centric. So as I go through this, uh, I may be biased in that direction. Um, I'm standing for the board. Uh, this election, and in preparation for that, I kind of reached out to some of the other large houses and kind of collected our opinions um, so that I could share them with you and get a little more sense of the history of Crossref. And this is kind of the, this is the summary of the opinion uh, that we sort of came up with. But, but originally, you know, Crossref was the publisher's linking service, and it's evolved to be, a, to basically occupy a unique position due to its scale um, and how it's evolved with all of its stakeholders and its essential uh, place in the scholarly infrastructure. And I wanted to say right now that we recognize this. We understand Crossref's potential for the future and that it's different from how it was started. Um, but because of disruption from outside the world of publishing, so when I, you know, I think about disruption to publishing, I don't think of other publishers. You know, increasingly, we have more need to work together on common infrastructure and standards. It's more than ever. I think of publishers almost like airlines, and we need airports that have common infrastructure for, this, for the sake of our customers. We don't each need to have our own baggage handling facilities. Uh, and you know, we, we, really, we really need to focus on this to remain competitive due to outside threats. And this is really driving a lot of new behaviors about how we're, how we're all working together. And then another just background point here is that the economics of STM publishing are changing dramatically. And this is due to the demands of open science and open access in particular. So the reality is that the publishing industry has a mix of business models. So we can talk about open access, but it will be a mix of business models for the foreseeable future. And I think we need to focus on what are the common needs of publishers, not just large like I'm up here representing, but all of us. Because one thing that I can say definitively is that publishers need and want efficient processes that are agnostic of business models and that, serves our, that serve our interests. So one of the big challenges we face, especially the large publishers, because we have very diverse business models and diverse portfolios, is that the volume and sort of nature of what we need to put out in terms of our output is changing. It's intensifying. We need to produce more of it. And it's getting more complicated to create. But the economics of the business are basically worsening. Um, a simple way of saying this is that article growth outpaces revenue growth. And that's basically a fact. And if you look at, if you look at the kinds of things, you know, Crossref kind of focusing over here, I'll talk a little bit about how there'll be more article growth from both regular articles and preprints, but also the artifacts that are associated with open science and the fact that publishers need to be able to deal with these things are going to basically intensify the need for the linking infrastructure and the need for persistent identifiers. And whatever we're doing now around 
the needs for content deposition and all that are going to explode, I think, in the next uh, year as we move into this open science era. So just a little bit about the tr what I think is driving the article growth is this transition to open access basically has changed kind of a fundamental about the economics of publishing. Um, in the open access era, there are marginal benefits to publishing new articles. In the old subscription era, it was mostly about quality. You, you wanted to reject as much as possible to drive up your impact factor and your quality so that your journals were more desirable to subscribers. And because of that shift in economics, publishers are publishing more. That's why you see more mega journals. You see more uh, attempts at the large publishers to place submissions within their portfolio because there's literally economic benefits to this. But then, you know, think about what's happening in Europe is basically we're shifting now into this world where people are subscribing to open access through read and publish deals. And you've got primarily this happening in one part of the world, which is Europe, which means that publishers have to exist in two economic models simultaneously. As that high quality output from Germany becomes free around the world, but most of the revenue comes from subscription model, publishers have to publish their way out of, their pro out of that problem. They have to publish more for the same top line revenue. All of this is essentially putting more articles out there. And if you look at the last two years of article growth, OO stands for online open. That's our shorthand, but it may basically means open access in subscription journals or otherwise known as hybrid journals. OA is driving this growth. So article growth might be relatively flattish at 3%, but OA is 8%. And this is, this is really a, a, a big dynamic at the large publishers. Preprints is another example of how our publishing output is going to expand really dramatically. So preprints were already growing 10 times faster than articles. This is cross-ref data. 24% growth rate compared to 3% industry for overall for articles over that time period. But it's just beginning because this is still the community preprint era. This is archive that started in 1991 um, combined with you know, this new wave of community preprints like BioArchive. Um, and it's still, you can see how fast it's growing in 2018, but what's happening now is that publishers are integrating preprint into their workflow as business as usual. So you see this with Cell Press at Elsevier, where basically authors submit to Cell, but they have the option of simultaneously preprinting in SSRN. You see this happening with Research Squared at Springer Nature, this in-review product. Wiley's about to do this with Authoria, which is something that we acquired. Um, and I'm sure more and more uh, publishers will do this. But basically, when you offer to an author, a journal author who submits to a journal, if you off offer them to simultaneously preprint that while you review it, getting about 35 to 40 percent of the authors are saying yes. So if you extrapolate this trend out, the amount of preprints are going to explode. Um, because basically, publishers are going to be putting them on the preprints after the submissions come to the publishers. Just the, just the three market leaders, Elsevier, Wiley, Springer Nature, if we were to do an under-review workflow across our whole portfolios with those kind of acceptance rates, I, we'd see about 900,000 new preprints. So this is just more about the stresses and demands that are happening to the infrastructure as a result of these open science changes. And then finally, this is kind of like my biggest area of interest is the artifact itself needs to change. So I look at like OA native publishers like eLife and Hindawi, they never had to go to print, never had to sell themselves to institutions, are able to innovate on new workflows that can better handle things like linked data, the modern kind of articles like, or computational notebooks that you know, researchers need to use. This trend will just not be uh, isolated to just the open access publishers. This, this trend will be all the big publishers will need to follow this too. So the reproducible article of the future, once we figure out how to retool our infrastructure so that we don't use traditional typesetters or we don't have PDF first revision workflows uh, and we can actually handle linked data in code as submissions, um, we're going to have a different looking artifact. What we used to consider supporting information, which was data and supplemental data, will now be inter inter integral information into the article. This will be another force that intensifies the need for this common linking infrastructure, and basically an explosion in the need for these sort of persistent identifiers and new kinds of policies that need to be sorted out going into the future. So when I think about cross drafts role, I really think about the future. I think about all this publishing, all this need for preprints, and then what the artifact itself is going to be going forward, um, which kind of sets up, I guess, the heart of the 
large publisher reasoning about Crossref. Um, sorry, one second here. So publishers founded Crossref and they continue to drive its income. Um, but it is our best example by far of an organization that has moved our industry forward in the face of technology-driven opportunities. I think that quote that Ed had put up earlier of the original charter that said, not only is Crossref a linking service, this is the place where we are going to come together uh, to solve more of these needs. Um, and, I, and I think it's not just the large publishers that need to have these needs met. It's really important that Crossref continues to support the long tail of smaller publishers. In fact, I think that's key to its, its success. So this is a busy slide, but I'm basically just making the point here that I think it's pretty well understood that DOI deposition fees drive Crossref's income. Although it seems like maybe less so because of this huge diversity in membership growth over the years, but still it's a major factor. Um, and within that, the short tail of the large content depositors still basically drive the overall economics. But many other stakeholders are deriving value from the Crossref ecosystem. And I think, you know, I, I think about the way this works. Think about a big, the, you know, the large publishers, the membership fees versus what they're paying for the content deposition fees. And I think of, you know, Elsevier. Elsevier and Clarivate probably spend around the same in terms of membership fees, but Elsevier has a content deposition bill that vastly dwarfs its membership fees because they publish lots of articles and need lots of DOIs registered. So there's, there's really an interesting dynamic about basically as we go into this future about how much content deposition fees and the cost of running that service um, can cross-pollinate all the activities and potential that Crossref has. So this is a graph that's essentially showing that Crossref's cost per DOI has been very flat, um, which is in a world where the costs of cloud computing have fallen dramatically. And we're also on the precipice of that red line for more DOIs going even further. And um, this is kind of this, so this, the thing that sets up. And I think, I think Jenny had made these points about how large publishers are starting to you know, think about this dynamic. And the other thing that's driving it, and this is the, the biggest point I want to get home today about publishers needing more than ever to work together, is that we have new funding demands for more common infrastructure and standards. Um, yet our landscape with which publishing industry can work together is becoming increasingly fragmented. So these are some of the problems um, that the publishing industry faces to be efficient and serve its customers better in a very sustainable way going forward. And yet we're kind of handling them in a, an increasingly large group of sort of forums to discuss them. We're getting to this place where almost every issue we need to solve in publishing gets its own single issue nonprofit spun up in order to solve it, which has a couple of problems. One is it's, it's very difficult to work across lots of, lots of these organizations. It's difficult for, for instance, technical talent to feel like they have a good career path when they work in a small nonprofit versus something like Crossref, which is really a dynamic place to work. Um, and I'm really just thinking about this. I think it is a true statement that publishers feel less comfortable bringing some of these issues to Crossref because of Crossref's stated mission around the linking service in the, in the metadata infrastructure as being its, a, its real mandate. So I leave you with that thought. I mean, is Crossref a scholarly infrastructure provider or is it a publisher services organization? Um, I don't really have the answer to that question. Um, I just pose it annoyingly to you without, without resolving it. Um, but I think it, I think it really is, uh, it is one of the keys going forward um, to, to figure this out. Okay, so it looks like I have about two minutes, but I don't know if that's enough time for questions. Peter Lammers, uh, John Benjamins Publishing. I heard you say that for uh, publishers have to do more uh, with less money per article. More articles for the same revenue. Yes. But you're, I thought you were also saying Crossref uh, should uh, make DOIs uh, um, 
uh, less expensive uh, in the sense that the, 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 the cost has been constant, but they are also doing more for one DOI. I mean, there have been many more new services. So doesn't it, isn't it a comparable uh, situation? Um, I, th I think the point that I'm trying to make is the, as Crossref expands into other areas, like the metadata service, um, the plagiarism detection service, fund ref, things like that. But it's still driven, the economics are still driven off of content deposition fees, yeah. which are going to even be a bigger infrastructure need the way publishing is heading. Is that cross pollinization a good thing? Have we lined up the incentives of Crossref with its funding priorities, which I think is key to its long term sustainability? So I think this is one of our big, you know, one of the concerns I think about. Yeah. Where, where Crossref is, is heading. So I think mostly that, that, that slide about the cost per DOI is to show that it's not a gentle arc upwards of, of the cost to provide the DOI service. Actually, it goes down as those scale. So you know, that core linking service economics is increasingly unrelated to what Crossref's trying to accomplish with things like the metadata service. And I think aligning these priorities is going to be one of the keys to keeping all the stakeholders happy. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat>